we've been kicking off a new, what we've been calling a season in Matthew's gospel in terms of our teaching. And we're not necessarily going through sort of verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so don't worry, it's not like 28 weeks in Matthew's gospel. Uh, But we thought we'd just sit and wait in Matthew's gospel and see how that goes. So tonight we're looking at a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 4. And just to recap, Jesus has been baptized, well he was born, got born before he got baptized, that's what we celebrate at Christmas, just in case you were wondering. He's born, he's baptized, and he's tempted in the wilderness, Uh, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he begins calling the first disciples, and he starts to go on his public ministry. And this is where we pick it up in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 to 25, just three verses. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee. That isn't just a place, that's a whole region. And he was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness among the people. News about him spread. It would be amazing, wouldn't it? Can you imagine every person, every disease, every sickness, every illness getting healed? Not even a hint of social media at that time, but it says that news about him spread all over Syria. So not just around uh, Galilee as that region, but it's gone beyond into Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. And the geography is important there. The writer of Matthew's gospel is Matthew. And uh, he wants to make this point that actually there's no place outside the realm of Jesus' touch. He covers every point of the compass, Galilee in the northwest, uh, the Decapolis in the northeast, Judea in the southwest, beyond the Jordan southeast, and Jerusalem at that time, which was known as the center of the known world. So there's nowhere that Jesus isn't planning on coming to. That's the point that Matthew is trying to make. And tonight I want to speak to us about doing the stuff. Doing the stuff. That was a phrase that was coined by an American pastor, the late John Wimber. And John Wimber, he went on to pioneer the vineyard movement. I think we've got a little picture of him here. And really, he had a huge impact, uh, his ministry all over this country, particularly uh, bringing the ministry of the power of the Holy Spirit. And like some of us, John Wimber, he fell in love with Jesus. He became a a convert to Jesus through reading the New Testament. And John said, you know, when he read the New Testament, when he read the stories about Jesus, I love the way he puts it. He's like, I liked the Jesus that I read about. I liked the, the man who healed the sick, who walked on the water who had compassion on people. I like this man who loved people unconditionally, who multiplied loaves and fishes. And being from California, when he, I've heard him describe that miracle particularly, he said, that was really hot. Imagine multiplying loaves and fishes. So you can understand why John Wimber, after he'd become a Christian, he was a little bit surprised when he turned up to church. And after three weeks or so, he thought, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And he found somebody who had one of those lanyards, one of the team, and he asked them this question. When do we get to do the stuff? And the member of the team looked a little bit quizzically and, what what do you mean? He said, you know, the stuff. The guy was still a little bit confused. You know, the stuff that Jesus did, like raising the dead, healing people, casting out demons, turning water into wine. That was a particular favorite miracle of his. But this team member at the church, he finally got what he was asking about. And they said, oh, you don't need to do all of that stuff. You just need to believe that it happened once. And John Wimber said that he was so disappointed. Is that it? And he realized that the church, 
They sang about the stuff. They got together in groups and talked about the stuff. They preached about the stuff. They prayed for the stuff. They, they gave money to the stuff. But rarely did they do the stuff that Jesus did. And John, understandably, was a bit disappointed and a bit disillusioned. If he was going to follow Jesus and work for Jesus, he wanted to do the stuff that Jesus did. And he said when he followed the devil, when he worked for the devil, the devil allowed him to do the stuff that the devil did. But he wanted to go on to do the stuff, do the things that Jesus did. And as followers, as friends, as disciples of Jesus, each one of us is called to do the stuff. I remember John Wimber once visiting the church where I grew up, St. Andrew's Chorley Wood. And principally he was teaching and encouraging the church at that time to do the stuff. He used to say that the, the meeting place was the learning place for the marketplace. In other words, when we gather together as Christians, we invite the Holy Spirit to come, we pray for one another, and we learn here in this place so that we can go out and minister to those that we come into contact with. And another of his phrases was that everyone gets to play. This ministry of the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not just for professional Christians. It's not just for the staff. It's not for the clergy, the ordained team, or for priests. This ministry of Jesus is for everyone. And so he got everyone praying, everyone ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. I was quite young at the time when he and a team from uh, Southern California visited the church. I was about 10 years old, so only about 20 years ago or so. Uh, that's a bit rude, Simon. <laughs> but I, you know, I, yeah, yeah, true, true, 47. But you know, I was 10 years old, and I can still vividly remember people coming forward, getting prayed for, and being healed. This one person particularly who uh, was in a wheelchair and after they'd been prayed for, they got up out of their wheelchair and the carer who'd been looking after them came and sat in the wheelchair and this woman started pushing him around the church and she was healed. And I remember thinking, that is amazing. Do you know what? I told that story in the service this morning. And this lady came up to me after the service and she just said, I think this morning you told a story about my grandmother. And she said that her grandmother hadn't been out of that wheelchair for 20 years. And in that moment, Jesus healed her. It was an amazing time. There were people being healed physically, emotionally, spiritually, people finding faith in Jesus for the first time. The Spirit was being poured out. And I think above all else, there was just this sense of excitement and expectation that God was real, that he was on the move and that he can make a difference. In this short passage that we've just read, just these three verses, we get a glimpse into Jesus' ministry, his strategic mission for planet Earth. He starts doing the stuff. Significantly, we see him doing four things. Firstly, it says he, he went throughout Galilee. He starts going around. He gets out and about. And then he teaches and he preaches. We don't need to get too tangled up on the difference between teaching and preaching. Some people think that teaching was for the believers in the synagogues. Other people think that the preaching was for out there for the non-believers on the streets. So he was going around, he was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing people. This is a huge theme in the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus goes, people get healed. The power and the presence of God in Jesus is present to heal. When Jesus is around, there's breakthrough in our lives. The Greek word for salvation is a word sozo. 
And this word, it goes beyond just the forgiveness of sins. But it also carries this idea of being physically healed of diseases or being delivered of an enemy coming into a place of freedom. And ultimately, that's what Jesus does. Jesus came to heal us. He is the remedy for all that is wrong with the world. Everything that we see, particularly at this time, everything that is wrong in this world, Jesus is the remedy. There's that little analogy, isn't there? If you ask a question in Sunday school, any question, the answer is Jesus. It's true. He's the cure. He's the savior. He's the one. And that's what Matthew, this gospel writer, is trying to point out. Jesus is the savior the healer, the Messiah, the Son of God that has come. And this moment here in Matthew's gospel, it's reminiscent to of Luke's gospel, that moment where Jesus goes into the temple, he unveils the scroll of Isaiah and he reads out, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. Here in the same vein, Jesus starts his public ministry. It says that he went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Jesus heals through speaking, and he also speaks through healing. These verses, in fact, they they kick off this whole section in Matthew's gospel. This verse right at the beginning here in verse 23, it's mirrored in Matthew chapter 9, 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. What Matthew's trying to do here, it's called an inclusio. Those two verses, they're kind of like bookends of a whole section that include the parables and miracles and the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to come on to next week. And what Matthew is trying to say here is that all of this builds this portrait of who Jesus is, not just as a man, not just as a human, but as the Son of God, the one who is divine and who comes to us. Jesus prays, uh, sorry, Jesus preaches the good news of the kingdom. And he teaches his disciples, friends, followers to pray for the kingdom. We prayed it earlier. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. We're instructed as his followers later in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto us as well. There are so many things that we could give our lives to, devote our lives to. But I believe that our lives find their fullest meaning and purpose only when we follow Jesus' call to join him in advancing the kingdom of God, to do the stuff of the kingdom. What does that mean? What is the kingdom of God. You may be on Alpha at the moment, or you might be a brand new Christian and thinking, what on earth have I come to? What is this guy going on about, this kingdom of God? I don't know how you feel about a Halloween weekend. Some people get a bit stressed that we shouldn't be emphasizing Halloween. And maybe they're right. I don't know. I don't know where you stand on that. But you know, some people think it's strange to celebrate the kingdom of darkness. But we, as Jesus' followers, we are about the kingdom of light. Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom. It's one of the major themes throughout Scripture. Many times he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. In his parables, over and over, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like, kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed that gets sown. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who plants a vineyard. Over and over, we see Jesus speaking about the kingdom. Through his words, through his actions, he's communicating and demonstrating the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Where there's God's jurisdiction, 
The kingdom of God is where there's God's rule and reign, where his authority reigns. In the beginning, going all the way back to the book of Genesis, God created his people and his world to be under his rule and his reign. But when sin entered the world, Adam and Eve, we read, are banished from the Garden of Eden. They're banished from that place of God's kingdom. And they become subject to death, disease, and decay. And the story of the Bible, this this love story, if you like, is about us being put back into right relationship with God. It's about God coming to this earth in the person of Jesus, rescuing us, as Paul said, from the dominion of darkness and bringing us into the kingdom of the son he loves. That's Jesus, bringing us into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. The Old Testament, right at the start of the Bible, it promised that the kingdom would come. The New Testament records the fulfillment of that promise in Jesus and the expectation of the final coming of the kingdom. When Jesus will return to this world, he will make all things new. As we read in Revelation 21 verse 4, right at the end of scripture, it says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Isn't that something that we long for more than ever at this time? I think we can extend that verse to recognize that when the fullness of the kingdom comes, there'll be no more injustice, no more disunity or division, no more threat of war, no financial crisis, no pandemics, no more grief, no more pain. That's the eternal hope that we have as Christians that one day Jesus will return. And that's why death has been swallowed up in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But until that day when Jesus returns, we live between these two ages, the kingdom now and the kingdom not yet. Because of what Jesus has done in coming to this earth, it's like we have a, we have a foretaste of this future eternal kingdom where everything is made right everything is reconciled but it's just a foretaste it's a little bit like in the spring uh, in April time you know sometimes you get those boiling hot days and you think particularly if you're English oh yes it's been a long winter but summer has come and the shorts come out and the t-shirt goes on and you think this is amazing and then the next day it's freezing And it's pouring with rain because you suddenly realize this isn't really summer, but this was just a foretaste of summer. And that's what these signs, these miracles that Jesus is performing, that's what they are. They're signs of a future eternal kingdom with him. And that's what Matthew wants to hammer home here in this passage to describe who Jesus is. It says that Jesus healed every disease and sickness among the people. People brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those suffering seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. In Jesus, there is this inbreaking of the future kingdom of God, his rule, his reign, his authority, his reconciling of all things. He's making things right, bringing healing, justice, and peace. I don't know how you've been feeling over these months, but suddenly the concept of peace seems so much more beautiful when our peace feels in some way threatened. Jesus came to reconcile us to God, to bring us peace. And I think that's what we long for now, maybe more than ever. But of course, sadly, it's not always what we see. We don't always see this future inbreaking of the kingdom. We live in this tension between the now and the not yet. It's a mystery. 
We, we pray for people, for physical healing, for emotional healing. We pray knowing that God does heal, and yet not everybody gets healed. And I know that that's a really difficult thing for so many of us. We seek justice, and yet we know that there's so much injustice in the world. We seek reconciliation in our relationships, and yet there's still so much brokenness in our relationships. And yet we are called as his followers, challenged, I would say, to live in that tension between the fallenness of this world and the glory of the future kingdom of God. For now, those things coexist. That's why the Apostle Paul, I think, is able to say, we're hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. And that's why as followers of Jesus, as his church, we're filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. It's been poured out so that we might be that demonstration of the kingdom of God. That's why we're called to do the stuff. Jesus revealed his kingdom through words, works, and wonders. And he calls us to do the same. To live like Jesus in the world. To make him our priority. To seek first his kingdom. I think it's good occasionally maybe to ask ourselves that question from time to time. How am I doing that in my life? What does seeking first the kingdom of God look like in my life? How does my life look different? Because Jesus, the one who came and will come again, how does my life look Different, other than I might go to church on a Sunday. What what am I doing to bring the kingdom of God on this earth, to pray for the kingdom of God to come? What do I center my life around? And I know that's not easy. I don't find that easy. I've been challenging myself, I think, principally as I've been preparing this. To what extent do I just live life pretty much in my own strength? What are the things that I know that I need to really rely on the Spirit of God for? Or am I just getting by, making it work? I'm struck here that Jesus, the very Son of God, he comes to this earth. The stuff he starts doing, he has to rely on the Spirit of God to make it happen. He can't do it in his own strength as a human, and he heals people. But it's not easy to speak about Jesus, to pray for people and keep that level of expectation. I know when I first became a Christian, maybe call it youthful enthusiasm, I I think I had such a sense of like, God's going to do it. You know, if 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 he's alive, then he's alive. You know, he can do anything. I remember seeing this guy who was blind with a stick walking down the street. And I I felt at the time that I sensed God saying, I think you should go and pray for that person. So I went up to that person and I said, oh, look, I'm a Christian. I just wonder, could I pray for you? And this guy just sort of went, get stuffed. (laughs) And I've prayed for so many people and I've not seen them get healed. And it can be disillusioning. And yet, we're called to... Stay expectant, to stay full of faith, to stay excited. But it's hard. It's hard in our work context. It's hard in our society to speak about him, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom in our schools, in universities. Because it's, I think it's more than countercultural. What God calls us to is actually otherworldly. The Apostle Paul, he says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, other places in the New Testament, we're called sort of aliens in this world. Why? Because actually we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. He's calling us. And the strategy that Jesus has always had is to work through his church, through his people. He's baptized, he's tempted in the wilderness, he's empowered by the Holy Spirit, and immediately Jesus begins to form the church. 
a community of friends. He calls two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew and James and John. And then it says here that all the people that he's healed, it says they followed him. There's nothing like somebody getting healed to see breakthrough, to see people turn to Jesus. And in this moment, the church is born. And of course, as we read on in uh, the book of Acts, the church goes on to grow exponentially. And 2,000 years later, here we are. We're still part of this story of the people of God gathering to see the inbreaking of his presence and his power. But just look at the impact that happened here in just this one area. Verse 24, it says, news about him spread. People gathered to him. Lives were changed, transformed, healed. Large crowds followed him. And surely the church is following Jesus the most when they're seeing people get healed, set free, delivered, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, going around, teaching, preaching, healing people. I long for us to be a church that just prays and worships passionately. A place where we can invite the Spirit of God to come and people can come and get healed. Whatever it is that might be disturbing them or challenging them, whatever situation or circumstance they find themselves in, this is a place where we will proclaim the good news of the kingdom and see breakthrough and people healed. The world must be able to look at the church and see something of God's eternal future kingdom. They must see our worship and see something of the worship of heaven. They should see something of our relationships and see something of reconciled, eternal relationships. They should see something about our inclusivity as a church and see it point them towards heaven when every tribe, nation, tongue, language will worship before him. They should see a church that is ready to go out with faith hope and love I don't know how you feel about that but when I sense his presence his call again to go out to do the stuff I know I can't do it in my own strength and I need to pray that he will come he will fill me again empower and equip me to be that kind of friend of his who follows him and does the stuff in Jesus name Amen.